Welcome back. Better than before, our leadership and business podcast powered by Clear Vision Development Group. I've got five primary skill categories I want to talk about that make you successful in business and life. So at Clear Vision, we've identified five primary skill sets that are categories that serve to build on your career and success. Being a CEO, if you have an aspiration to own your own business, lead a business of size, or be successful in the executive ranks, here are the five primary skill categories. First one is self-management. And I've gotten on this soapbox before that I don't believe in time management. I don't teach time management. I don't discuss time management. I talk about self-management. There's no way to manage time. It's a flawed concept to begin with. You cannot save 15 minutes for later. It just doesn't work. You can't, it's not a pastrami sandwich. You can't wrap it up in foil, put it in the refrigerator and go, what did I do with that 15 minutes? So time saving devices are a misnomer. You can't save time. You can't manage time. Time is fluid. You have less of it now than you did when you started listening to this podcast, but don't stop listening. So self-management's the number one category. Number two is productivity, addressing the skills needed in order to get things done. Communication is the third category, uh, how we impart or exchange information and meaning. Perception is the fourth category. Perception deals with how we see the world and what we think about ourselves, others, and the world around us. Under perception, that goes into our intentional and subconscious patterns of thought. So in uh, perception, you could have two different types of thinking. We've talked about that in previous podcasts. You can have a scarcity type thinking, or you can have an abundant type thinking. Interpersonal. Interpersonal primarily refers to our dealings with other people. How do we get along with other people? How do we manage and think about our relationships, professional and personal? What's our track record in coaching other people to bigger degrees of productivity and larger degrees of success? That all falls under interpersonal. So the five primary category skill sets are self-management, productivity, communication, perception, and interpersonal. Now that I've defined the broad categories for you, there are 52 skill sets that come under those five. And today, I primarily want to talk about the self-management skills uh, that fall under this broad category, number one, of self-management. So let's talk about number one, self-confidence. And we define self-confidence as the ability to trust and believe in yourself. There are at least seven sides of self. There's self-esteem, there's self-confidence, there's self-concept, there's self-sabotage. There are seven sides to yourself. And so self-confidence is a component of that. And it's the ability to trust yourself, the ability to believe in yourself, the ability to allow yourself to succeed. You believe you are more than enough, and I think you might be surprised that some of the people that you work with or some of the leaders out there who do not believe that they deserve success. Even if they have a certain amount of success and they believe they don't deserve it, they have what we call the imposter syndrome, and they feel that they're going to be exposed at any minute, uh, which is also uh, not healthy. So number one skill in self-management is self-confidence. And I will also tell you that being disorganized is a big factor in self-confidence. When you're disorganized, how do you feel? You feel like you can't get anything done. You don't know where anything is. Things are junky. You have to search for stuff. You don't feel, if I'm putting my fingers in the air doing the quotation sign, you don't feel together. A big part of self-confidence is getting yourself organized, getting your desk cleaned off, getting your files filed in the right spot. Knowing where stuff is uh, gives you a lot of confidence. Number two is sense of humor. And we define having a sense of humor as having a lighthearted outlook on the world with the ability and laugh and appreciate a joke. Not necessarily deprecating humor. 
where you believe, well, people are going to make fun of me, so I'll beat them to the punch and make fun of myself. And that makes me feel better about the environment and the whole atmosphere around me. Uh, I feel more comfortable if I'm stabbing myself before anybody else stabs me. That's not sense of humor, right? That's self-deprecating, which is indication of another deficit. Sense of humor is you just like and appreciate a good joke. You like to laugh, but it's not at people's expense. It's not what we used to call in the locker room of athletics, pick-ass humor where you're just pick ass at somebody you're just picking at them and you down me and I down you and you down me and I down you and we're just trying to top each other it's not what sense of humor is number three living in balance and there's a whole lot of talk these days about work life balance and I'll just give you my philosophy on that there's no such thing so if you're looking for the ideal work life balance you have to work it out for yourself. And the reason I say that is some people like working. So if you take somebody who likes working and they get a lot of fulfillment out of work, they get a lot of enjoyment out of work, and it doesn't feel like working to them, they're just having fun, they can't get enough of it, they enjoy what they do, then along comes a well-meaning person that says, wow, you work too much, you need work-life balance. You need to be doing a lot of other things besides working. And that person thinks to themselves, gee, I really enjoy my job a lot. I really enjoy what I do. And I really enjoy working. But this person's telling me that I'm working too much. See, we got to be careful about that. We can't put everybody in the same jar. It just won't work. Some people desire time with their family. They desire recreation time. And that's wonderful. In that case, you need to work it out where you get plenty of that along with a healthy work balance where you fulfill your responsibilities, you fulfill your quota or whatever it is you're responsible for. But living in balance is different for every single person. And for some people, 90% work and 10% not working may be perfect for them. You got to let them have a say in it, right? So you got to know how to moderate and how to realign priorities when things are disproportionate. And you have to let that person have a lot of input on what's appropriate and uh, what's disproportionate. Number four, purpose. Knowing and living according to the reason you were put on this planet. Or I like to ask, tell me why you get out of bed every day. I've talked about this before, but I was doing a seminar in St. Louis a couple of years ago, and I have this list of coaching questions I like to ask, and I like to ask the audience. It's good interaction. And so I had that question. I think it might be the very first question on my framework is, why do you get out of bed every day? And this guy says, stands up in the back, and he says, to get a paycheck. And I'm like, man, that's the only reason you get out of bed every morning is just to get a paycheck. Well, if you want to have true fulfillment in what you do, you have to tie that paycheck to some sort of purpose. I mean, that money has to go to something that you enjoy or some future benefit. If you're just in the treadmill chasing the carrot every day and you catch a little of it every now and then, that that gets old after a while and that wears on your energy level. Number five is risk-taking. Risk-taking, the ability to step out on a limb when necessary And not always play it safe. Uh, It could even include entrepreneurial thinking. Some people take risk taking way too far and they do stupid things that cost them a lot uh, because they're too risky. Other people are too risk averse. They won't try anything new. They won't try anything different. They won't step out at all. So you've got to figure out a way to hone your skills in risk taking so that you get the appropriate amount of risk and the appropriate amount of reward. Number six is competitiveness. Competitiveness. If you hire a manager, you better make sure they have a healthy amount of ambition and they're willing to get in the field of play and they're willing to mix it up with the challengers, the rivals, the competition. There's somebody you want to get in a foxhole with. If you don't want to get in the foxhole with that person you're considering for a manager position, you better not put them in there. Because if you're the head person 
It's you and them against everything else. And so they need to have a certain amount of competitiveness to them uh, to help drive the team forward. Number seven, they need to be a learner and they need to have a big desire to learn. And what this would include is a curious outlook on the world and also a thirst for new knowledge and new experiences. Again, I had a client and she was reading, I think somewhere around 80 or 90 books a year. And I asked her, I said, well, what are you learning and what are you executing? And that's the answer I got. She wasn't really retaining a lot of the information and she wasn't really executing on it, but she was reading it. I cut her back to 25 books a year and ask her to come up with a plan after she reads every book, then come up with a plan on how you're going to take what you learned and how you're going to apply it and what it's going to do for you. Boy, she found that a lot more productive and she found her time more productive and she enjoyed reading even more. If you ever go to a seminar, a workshop, a conference, or read a book, and you don't do anything different that helps increase your results, you just wasted your time. Number eight, coachability. Being coachable is all about humility. You have to be willing to submit yourself. You have to be willing to be in submission to somebody else to coach you and give you the chance to learn new skills from them. We know wisdom comes from a multitude of counselors, so you may have more than one coach. You may have more than one advisor. You may have more than one person that you draw from, and so you draw water from the wells of knowledge, and you may have more than one well that you dip into, but you've got to have the humility inside to submit yourself to somebody, and you have to say, teach me. I'm willing to learn. Being coachable for some people is really difficult because they have a hard time admitting their mistakes and they have a hard time with their flaws. And they especially have a hard time when somebody else points it out or it gets exposed. You have to learn that when somebody hits your truth button, when somebody says something that's true about you and it stings just a little, you have to learn that, hey, pain equals growth. So if it's hurting me a little bit, it's probably good for me. Number nine is emotional intelligence, or we also call that EQ. And emotional intelligence was discovered and basically invented by Dr. Daniel Goleman back in 1994. And it's a realistic understanding and perspective of oneself that includes self-awareness, self-regulation, social skills, motivation, and empathy. Those are the five areas of emotional intelligence. And one skill set builds on another. So in other words, you have to be self-aware before you can self-regulate. And you have to be able to self-regulate before you can direct your motivation. And you have to be able to direct your motivation before you can get good at social skills. And you have to be good at social skills before you can have empathy. So those are the EQ emotional intelligence segments. One skill builds on another and follows another. Number 10 is grit, just like the John Wayne movie. True grit. The resilience, commitment, and diligence to work hard and keep going during the tough times. So how resilient are you and how gritty are you? So on resilience, you're driving in in the morning and somebody cuts you off in traffic and it really makes you mad and ruins your day and you get to work. How long does it take you to recover? Are you good to go in about 10 minutes or is your whole day ruined? Or just anything like does an emergency in the morning or a flaw in your plan or something that went awry? How long does it take you to recover from that? Does it take you a whole day or does it just take you a few minutes? With resiliency, you have to develop the skill set to get over things pretty quickly. Number 11 is enthusiasm. It's basically a passion internal motivation to take on new challenges with determination and a positive attitude. Number 12, ethics, honesty, integrity, truthfulness in your work, life, and relationships, being very conscious in keeping your word. And so if you can't do something, just simply say, I can't do it. If you aren't going to show up somewhere, just say, no, we'll have to schedule it for another time. Uh, I've told the story a bunch. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite stories, but I used to freak people out at church because 
in church, people come up to me and say, are you going to be at the picnic on Sunday? And I'd say, no. And they're waiting for my excuse of why I can't come to the picnic on Sunday. And I'm not going. I'm just not going. There's no excuse needed, right? Where a lot of people would say, well, I, we're going to try to be there. I don't know if we can or not, but we're going to try to show up. And they know right then and there they ain't going. So be an ethical person, be an honest person, be a truthful person. Only give your word in circumstances where you absolutely know that you can keep your word. If you absolutely know you can't deliver and keep your word, then don't say you will. Don't do it. Number 13 is friendliness. Uh, and that's just being generally kind toward other people. It isn't being nice for the sake of just manipulating other people into liking you. It's a goodness People should be able to tell if you have their best interests at heart or are you only interested in using them. It's a kindness that people can either see in you or they can't see in you. Number 14 is adaptability, having the versatility and flexibility to adjust when conditions or environments shift or change. We were just talking about the television networks earlier. Television has shifted. It's changed. It's a whole new world. This is not 1985. People have 52 weeks a year now of programming that is being streamed into their house that they control. And so the more that you control it and the less that they control it, you would think you would put more in their hands and less in yours to try to compete. But that's just a good example of not being adaptable. Number 15, being authentic authenticity, being real, not pretending, not grandstanding, not posturing, but actually being real. And number 16, the last skill on the self-management list, being assertive, being assertive. Uh, that means confidence, but not aggressive. I've known people in my career where they were just a tad aggressive they weren't being assertive, they were being aggressive. And you basically just have to, you know, back them up a, a notch or two when they get, they overstep. On the assertiveness, though, I would also say it's the ability to communicate with confidence and uh, skill. And it's being able to take the full range of your thoughts and emotions and being able to communicate those to somebody else in a way that's easily understood. If something really bothers you or you're angry, it's being able to communicate that thing that bothers you and the thing that angers you in a way without being extremely angry. So being assertive is that ability to communicate with confidence and skill, the full range of your thoughts and emotions. So those are the 16 skills that fall under the major heading of self-management. If you're going to be successful in business, you're going to be successful in life, you need a lot of those skill sets. And I will tell you why I'm an expert on this, because I screwed all this up uh, at one time or another. I've been in a situation where I wasn't self-confident. I've been in a situation where I took too many risks or didn't take enough risks. I've been too competitive uh, at some point in my career. I've not been coachable. I've not had a, a lot of enthusiasm. I've not been friendly. I mean, I've I've had a lot of experience in these, and I've also had people who displayed wonderful attributes in these skills and some people who didn't have a clue. Uh, they didn't know come from Sikkim with some of these skill sets. So um, I hope you took some notes and wrote those down, and we'll examine those in the days and weeks ahead because I think there's a lot of value in that for you. Thank you for listening to Better Than Before with Tony Richards a business leaders podcast powered by Clear Vision Development Group. For more resources from Tony, visit clearvisiondevelopment.com. Join us next time for another episode of Better Than Before with Tony Richards. Yeah.